think of men's business was really formed as a way for men to advocate self-acceptance. On today's show, we have the epiphany of what Secret Men's Business is about, a man that actually went into the community and tried to make a change. Hi, this is Joey Buzzatool, and welcome to the Secret Men's Business Podcast. On today's show, we're going to be speaking to Andrew Heslop, who is a good friend of mine and someone who's been out in the community and on radio and everywhere, really, to make change. Andrew, how are you? I'm very well, thank you, Joe. The change man. So you've been, you've done a lot, haven't you? Like I was looking at your resume and looking at your profile. I mean, I've known you for a while, and it's funny how you know someone, but you don't really know them until you go into their resume. Um, so for the audience, you want to maybe just give them a bit of a quick snapshot of what you do. What I do? Well, now I'm a keynote speaker and um, an MC, and uh, although I've not been very busy as a result of COVID, but um, I started my career as a journalist and a program maker in Adelaide in 1985 when I was still at secondary school, and I was absolutely besotted with the media. I'd done children's television in Adelaide when I was a toddler, and I just had this huge interest in it. Um, and it's one of the things I really credit my late mother for doing because she took this four-year-old hyperactive toddler and put him in children's television. And when you take kids certainly at that time, and put them in a big studio with big cameras and bright lights. Kids used to shrink, whereas I was exactly the opposite. I certainly, you know, performed for the camera as you had to do, but I didn't feel nervous about it, and I was never scared of the medium. And it's something that even today when I go into a television studio, you know, what, how old am I? 51. So, you know, 47 years later, I still get that buzz and that sense of excitement of what is uh, a really interesting industry for me, but obviously which has changed so much over the last 47 years. Mm. I mean, you get like it's interesting, isn't it? So obviously you feel at home there. And I mean, I was going to ask you the next question, what made you attractive? And it was your mother. That's lovely. And so there was a way for you to do that at a young age, which I think is good to grow up wanting that passion and that, that career. Um, so are there any things that you do get nervous about? Like, do you find that, you know, being in front of a camera at your at home, but you might find other environments that cause you to have anxiety or nervousness? Oh, look, uh, in the last couple of years, I've developed anxiety and panic attacks. And from someone who's being so comfortable with being on live television or speaking on live radio, where I don't get nervous, where I don't get um, thrown by that situation at all. But um, as a, as a result of a work-related injury, I couldn't get on a tram. The doors would open, I'd go to step on, and I couldn't get on. Uh, I'd try to go to the supermarket, and I couldn't go into the supermarket. I had to almost rush out. Um, and, it, and I had to eventually say to the supermarket management, I'm not a shoplifter. I'm just being really challenged by the noise, the lights, all of this activity that's going on in the store. And so what I do is go and sit down, sit outside the supermarket and to try and get on top of that anxiety or panic attack and to be able to go back. But um, I would never, ever have thought in my life that I would have been somebody who was dealing with panic attacks and anxiety. Um, but these things happen at the strangest situations and for the strangest reasons. Mm. I mean, it's really, um, thank you for sharing that because I, di yeah, I didn't know that. And it's interesting how, you know, when I see clients, they normally run away. They normally stay at home. But what you did was you went and you spoke and you're dealing with it, which is good. And it's also, thank you again for saying that you weren't expecting it because I think that's a really important message because a lot of people do not understand it until they go through it. And the, our aim at Secret Means Business is to get people aware, because I think we're living in a faster society, which is going to start causing anxiety. You know what I mean? Like everything now is fast. Um, do you have an idea of what triggered your anxiety? Was it the actual event or was it, it after? It was, a, it was a workplace issue which which led to me developing panic and anxiety attacks. But my husband, my ex-husband, he also lived with panic and anxiety. And while I was enormously empathetic and, and watched how it, you know, came on all of a sudden, 
I didn't understand it until it began to happen to me. And mm. I think that's a lot of um, the reason behind our interest in mental health. Certainly, we're much more comfortable talking about it and talking about different areas of mental health and how they impact us personally, our partner, uh, our kids, a close relative, or, and even our friends. So we're much more open about it. And while I say that, which is great, we're not, I don't think, as good as understanding it. And, and when you someone is going through a mental health episode, in my experience, what you need to do is be present. Mm. Don't send a text. Don't send a Facebook message. Don't send a tweet. If you're really concerned about someone close to you and what they're going through, go and knock on the door because yeah. what it needs is someone to break that cycle because it's very easy to see Facebook messages or SMSs or tweets or whatever building up, but they're just building up. They're being, yeah. you know, they're, they're not being accessed. But when you're actually knocking on someone's door whom you care about to say, are you okay? That's what more of us should be doing. Yeah. I mean, it's funny. We were just talking about this yesterday because I was talking to some of my friends about my grief with losing my mother. And it was all, everyone sent, te everyone sent text messages. I didn't actually, people didn't call me. And I'm, that's fine. But I thought, I thought, let's talk about this. So do you think that this is the way that we are, that we are becoming entrenched with? I mean, I even heard of people breaking up with their partners on text. So yes. it's just so easy now. So while we're on the topic, um, I was going to ask you later on. So in your industry, the media industry, how do they deal with mental health? Well, are in, they good? Uh, I think some employers are better than others. Um, and, and I think part of it is that we're all better at understanding what it is. But when, in my circumstance, where it was a workplace issue which caused or led to me developing it, that's a little bit more challenging. But I see certainly um, around lots of businesses, whether they be government or private sector, you know, there's, there's a lot of talk. We're here for you. There's an employee assistance line for you to call. There's free counselling available. Yes, we need to make more use of, of those tools and resources that are available to us. But I still think there are many, many people who are going through a mental health issue who are probably very nervous about disclosing that to their employer because they don't want to be discriminated against, certainly. Um, they don't want their job to be impacted. And they certainly don't want to be the butt of gossip and innuendo around the business. So, so it's really challenging. And it's, it's something that, again, you know, we all have to be better at understanding. And that's more than, you know, just, you know, ticking a box or putting a ribbon on your Facebook page or whatever to say, you know, I'm an advocate. That's great, but you need to take it a couple of steps further. Yeah, I totally agree. I mean, like, I work for an EPA and I speak to the employees um, about all the things that the business offers, but then they're all complaining about stress and too much work. And not, I mean, of course, we don't disclose, but it's like it's fair to do okay you know what we're going to give you double the work so here's the number for e you know for counseling it, rather than looking at the workload because people were getting so stressed that they were leaving and it's the same thing with say secret men's business everyone was really excited at the beginning and then COVID came to a standstill sort of and everyone went back to work and we have to be aware of it all the time and that's the thing it's like if we don't talk about it then we're going to be reactive rather than proactive because it has to sort of change um yeah, it has to change because men now are becoming more open to talking about it, which is a good thing. I was one of the federal government's uh, champions for the National Broadband Network when it was first announced. And one of the things that I learned going to roadshows and talking to communities across the country, certainly from the employer's perspective, was it's great to be able to do remote working. Yes, it be fantastic to have people working from home but how can you trust them you know how do you know they're actually going to be doing the work how do you you know how do you stop them skiving off and so you fast forward uh, to last year when suddenly the globe 
fairly much has to work from home and the productivity has changed. Uh, and I, I haven't seen any formal statistics around it, but I think it's actually been a very interesting circuit breaker, not just for the employer, but for the employee as well, because they can work around the hours and the activities that they need to deliver that suits them in their circumstance. Now, as we're recording this, you know, in Victoria, certainly, you know, the situation has changed again and more people will be able to return to the office fairly soon. Um, and certainly as the vaccination program rolls out, that's going to change things again. But I really would like to think that employers who have the ability to allow their staff to have more flexible working hours are going to be able to do that because the productivity surely has to bear. Um, and it also means that it's a better allocation of resources, particularly for those people who move up into middle and senior management, that you don't always have to be on the shop floor to be working at 100% capacity. Yeah. I, look, for me, it's all about the KPIs. They need to be realistic. I think there were people that had sale KPIs when we were in lockdown. Like, how can you... It's impossible to sell to someone when you would go out selling. I mean, you yes. know, so it's all about adapting. So on that on that note, I can really... I just can I just come back to you on that? I, I found it really interesting in one of my first executive roles. Um, I was one of the youngest executives in in the organisation, and one of the more senior bosses just said, took me aside one day and said, "You know, are you sure that you're managing your team correctly?" And I and I just sort of looked at her and said, "Well, yes. What what do you mean? Do is there something you'd need to bring to my attention?" And she said, "Well, you seem very flexible with your people. You know, they're not here." Here at a quarter to nine and taking morning tea at half past 10 and lunch at 20 past 12 and afternoon tea at, at quarter to three um, and gone home by quarter to five. I mean, they, they, they seem to be here, you know, whenever they choose. And I said, well, that's right, because the work that we're doing, which involves often being on call uh, and having to work after hours on weekends, um, I'm giving them the flexibility to decide when they want to finish the work that I've tasked them to do. And as a as a manager, I don't care if they come in at seven o'clock in the morning and finish at three or come in at 10 and finish at six or whenever they choose to do it, as long as it's delivered by the deadlines and if there are issues or problems, you know, we worked on that as we go along. And, and it was a really interesting learning for me uh, as, as a relatively new executive to understand some of the pitfalls and some of the blockages um, that exist in at the that did exist at the time in business that let you know people work in a way that was not suitable to the employee but suited the organization and as I said just before you know COVID has has dramatically changed that yeah I mean like in my industry it's totally like um we went online and I no one had done that before or thought of that and like now I, don't, I find it really hard to even consider going back to the office <laughs> because it is it, the tra for me it's the driving. Like I don't feel as stressed because I have a two and a half hour commute every day. Mm -hmm. So if I remove that, that's two and a half hours of me going to the gym or something. And so I'm feeling better. And I, I work two days a week. And when I drive, it's like oh my god, you know. So yeah, it, it has. It'll be interesting to see how that unfolds through to 2021. Well, I've, I have a friend who uh, is a, a senior executive and, and and his business was divided into four groups and they were all rostered to appear at the office on a particular days at work uh, once that was allowed. Um, and on one occasion, he turned up and there was, you know, two other people in the office and you know, where is everyone else? Because, you know, all of the people in the green team should be uh, on site today. Um, and when they actually inquired of, uh, of of the team members, it was like, well, it wasn't convenient for me to come in today, so I'm going to work from home. So these are going to be some of the challenges yeah. for employers to manage to say, okay, well, let's put in place a more formal structure for working from home activ activities, yeah. Yeah. So if it's okay with you, I wanted to explore your experience in the media. And so as a, as a person that witnesses the media, I've noticed a big change with um, journalism. Like one of the things that I've really noticed was I remember a day when there used to be both sides of the story in a really good article or story. Now I sort of feel like everything is leaning towards the left or the right. And I know that a lot of that's got to do with, say, ownership and, I don't know, 
trends and fake news and all that stuff. I just wanted to get your head information around how you see it. What do you? How do you see journalism and news reporting as of today? Well, What's I know. I know from the ABC's perspective, you know, we, we try very hard to be balanced, to present both sides of the story when it is possible to present both sides of the story. Um, and, and as a journalist, I mean, one of the part, parts of the uh, journalism standard uh, of ethics uh, is that, you know, you do investigate and present both sides of the story. It's, it's really integral to what you do. Um, you know, but Marketing has changed the media. Media has changed marketing. And commercial media is vastly different today than it was when I started in 1985. Part of that was um, there's, there was always a, a natural um, bias from owners about how they believed their organisation should work. And it might be a, 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 quite a surprise for many people to learn that the uh, the stable of um, newspapers, which were Fairfax and now are part of Nine Media, like in the, in the 60s and 70s, they were actually very conservative. They were, the Fairfax family um, really did run them as a personal fiefdom. And um, when the Mardi Gras protests began in Sydney, the Sydney Morning Herald was among the publications which published the names, the addresses and the occupations of those people who had been arrested for protesting. Today, I mean, it would be absolutely aghast for a media company to do that. Um, and, and these days, people might say that the, the nine media group of newspapers are more left-leaning. Um, and again, I think it also depends on your perspective um, and, and what it is that you look for in a news organisation yeah. and, and, and where you choose to get your information from. Mm. Can I ask you, but, though, like, how come, I mean, I sort of feel like we don't notice that. Like, you know, I, I, COVID was one of the biggest things that I noticed where when you turn the TV on, it was very catastrophized and very dramatic, right? So it sort of like was leading the mood. But with those smaller stories, do you think that the public just don't notice that they're being influenced like that? Or do you think that we know now and we'll just, we just go seeking the, the place we're going to find news that agrees with us? Yeah, well, you tend to flock to news media that you feel comfortable with, whether that's Channel 9, if you're still into linear television, um, you know, analogue television rather, if you're still into 10 o'clock, uh, Channel 10, Channel 9, Channel 7, whatever, uh, if you only ever buy the Herald Sun or the Daily Telegraph or the Courier Mail, you know, if you're in cities which only have one newspaper, that's a bit of a problem. But, you know, we all have an intimate bias about where we believe the news is best sourced from. Yeah. Um, and the best thing we can always do is, is read more widely. Now, you know, and 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 that's not just the publications, the newspapers that you agree with. It's also the newspapers that you don't agree with, because you should see what somebody else is arguing against your worldview. I think that's a very healthy thing. Yeah, okay. But 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 certainly, um, we we live in an environment where the media has changed absolutely. Uh, again and again and again over the last 10 years. In one sense, it is shrinking. Um, the, 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 the outlets for news are shrinking. But then alternatively, um, we, people are getting their news from other sources. And there's been yes. this huge global debate about Google and Facebook um, using mainstream media's uh, content for their own um, advertising purposes. Um, I you know, I've been saying this probably for at least 20, maybe even 30 years. You know, my, the people in my immediate friendship group have not been watching the six o'clock news for decades. Uh, they might have grown up doing that with their parents, watching at 6.30 or 7 o'clock uh, if, they, if they chose the ABC. But as younger people, they're getting the news from other sources during the day. Uh, there are 24-hour news channels. Uh, Twitter is constantly alive with news. So, so the, the sources that we get our information from have broadened, absolutely. Um, and again, it, it, you follow people on Twitter, for example, um, that tend to 
to promote um, your your view of the world and your opinion. So you're you're unlikely to um, get involved unless it's um, shared by somebody else, someone who has an opposing perspective. Um, yeah. And 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 I and I don't think that's you know extremely dif- different from what I grew up with. It's just the the sources have changed. Yeah. So uh, I asked you that question because I'm leading into the second question, which is. There's a lot of anxiety about fake news, mm. but I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it in my clinics. Like I'm talking about really young people, like really anxious. So, how does someone navigate what they know they can believe or what they can feel? Would it be avoiding, like you said, like your friends all seek it from the places? Like because I think the catastrophes or the or the worry news is creating now a ripple effect in mental health. It's very hard thing to do, but the, the but the best thing to do is turn it off. I used to be a huge consumer of radio news, television news. I would, if I was home during the day, I'd start with breakfast television. I'd watch the morning news. I'd be there in the afternoon for the afternoon bulletins on each of the channels. I'd be there at seven o'clock at night watching at the ABC. Uh, and then in the old days, I'd be watching late line at night. So I was fully immersed in news. And part of that was my job. You know, I, it came with the territory. Now, um, I find it quite easy to turn off the radio um, to change channels so move from you know a say for example ABC local radio if I've heard too much about the local coverage of COVID uh, I might move to Radio National if I've had too much of that there I might go and listen to the BBC World Service and then if I have all of those channels and then completely full up with information, I just turn it off. But it's very hard, particularly when you're immersed in social media all day and you're constantly on Facebook or TikTok or Instagram or Twitter or yeah. any of the other new technology that uh, that shares information. Um, you, it is really addictive to be caught up in that because um, it's, it's that, you know, Pavlov's dog situation you know you, you you find a trigger it responds to you you want to keep going and then two hours later you're still in this um endless loop um and if, if you're if you're challenged by it if you're finding it difficult to adjust to do do the hardest thing but the simplest thing and and literally turn it off yeah i think that your point about marketing is really relevant it's like you know especially when you see certain um like stories and they use the same word like with the Megan and Harry interview for example the word was bombshell mm-hmm. every single news broadcast used the bombshell interview bombshell interview right so how do you feel about what would you say to someone that decided to ter- not connect with any media like do you I, think that's a good thing for someone not to know any news I, I look I think yes I it it's, is. it's hard because you're a media person yeah that's right <laughs> and it, look it, 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 it is hard but but I think you can be more selective about where you choose to get your information from yeah and you know Facebook and Twitter especially is full of bots retweeting fake news um, and the fake news is made up by other bots which publish headlines and things that are out of context. Um, I used to, you know, in the last year, there used to be um, clickbait on Facebook, which would take screenshots of an ABC program as an example um, and say, you know, Michael Rowland was outraged against blah. And of Mm. course, you click on it and it wasn't anything to do with that. It was just an opportunity to, A, get you to click on the link. Um, Sometimes it's a little bit more malicious because it comes with spyware. Um, But we're really sucked in very easily, but we've always been sucked in very easily by a headline. Um, yeah. The, the head, headlines aren't going to go away, but it's it's how you choose to react yeah. to those things. And, you know, I might be one of the very few people in Australia, in fact, probably potentially in the world, who hasn't seen the Harry and Meghan interview. <laughs> you know, yeah. you know I, 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 think I, 
I saw it for you because I saw it four times. <laughs> oh, good. Um, I, I have enormous empathy for him and his brother of, of what they've been through. I've had a similar situation. My mum died at seven when I was seven. Um, she, she acquired uh, cancer and she died very quickly. Um, so I know what those boys are going through in the sense of their day-to-day -day lives and and how as you as you go through your life, you, your mum's not there for really important occasions made enormously hard for both of them by being two young men in the global spotlight and no matter what they do people will always have an opinion and sadly uh, for for both of them you know they're always going to be the target of news it's just sadly they've just been born into a family that is part of that news cycle yeah um but 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 it, it is really tough and it and it must be very tough to grieve and mourn um when you're in such a high profile position mm. um in in a in a circumstance where everyone in that um thrall of royalty has an opinion about how you should be reacting to it yeah well, the whole world does. And I was just wondering, again, this is an opinion for you because I know that it's such a big question, but do you think that the media is aware of their responsibility, to how they impact people's mental health, or do they not care? I think media, I think media are increasingly more conscious of it. I think um, credible journalists and media organisations certainly are aware of the triggers and and one of the things that I've been really happy to see the ABC do on, on broadcast or online is to provide um, links to Lifeline or Beyond Blue or other organisations that can provide help and assistance at the tail of a story that might have um, drawn problems or, or issues for the people who've mm. consumed it. So I think that's a really mm. good thing. What about the um, other side, though? The other side meaning... And again, we don't know the truth because it's just all speculation. But the say, for example, going back to Meghan and Harry, right? Like there were certain news agents and papers and all that that actually promoted all this really full on stuff that creates, I don't know, like I, re I even got upset reading it that one of the papers was calling their child, they compared it to a gorilla, right? So I'm not, I'm not talking about that side of it, like editorially. Is there, do they care? Do they, will someone turn around and say, look, that, Title that heading might trigger some what some people. So let's stop, let's stop, let's pull that story. I'm guessing that's going to be a no, isn't it? Well, I I, th I think it depends on the publication and the management of the publication and the ownership of the publication, and what they're willing to do to get a story out. But also, their commercial organisations, their job is to sell a story, yeah. and they, in order to sell a story to be attractive to advertisers, they need to have you know certain numbers of eyeballs watching on TV or listening to the radio or seeing it online or buying a newspaper. So a lot of that is just to generate sales yeah. so that they can in turn sell themselves to yeah. advertisers. And your and point then before was to make sense then. It's up to us to turn it off. Absolutely, it's up to us to turn it off. It makes sense uh, now what you said. It is hard to turn it off. Look, I, 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 I was made to watch a television program which is ostensibly about people getting married to the love of their life. Oh, and love, love at first sight. <laughs> married at first sight. Love at first sight, yeah. Yeah, it, uh, it, it certainly wasn't something that, you know, I, I would sign up for a second episode of. But what I found really intriguing behind all of that was at the end of the day, it was all about the nudge, nudge, wink, wink of have they had sex, have they seen each other naked yeah. um, on commercial television. And, of course, you know, they're, they're wanting to get us sucked in. Um, but, you know, if you really want to see people and know that they've had sex, you know, you can look at all sorts of other websites to find that kind of thing. So I found it really interesting that it's, it, you know, commercially palatable to run a program like that. But the the other point of that is, you know, maybe 1.4 million Australians tuned in yeah, to watch it. Okay. So that's, you know, and and I'm being, you know, one of these, you know, I've, I've my programs that I've worked on have, have lived or died because of their ratings. But for example, a program that might attract 1.4 million viewers for that night or whatever, just remember that there are 23 million other Australians 
who were not watching that program. So we tend to get caught up in the hype about highest rating programs and the most watched show forever, particularly on commercial television. But just, just remember, at least 23 million other Australians found something better to do. Yeah, that's a good point. And, and a lot like, of those people will have their television turned off. Yeah, because I avoided, I don't watch commercial television and I feel like it's a big dumb, it dumbs people down. It's a simpler version of life. But I have to admit, when I did by accident see that last season of that show, I got hooked. And like, so I really had to be conscious not to watch it again this year because it's it's a formula. It's a, it's a, a it's a distraction, B, it's attractive, C, it's the scandal, like you were saying, that curiosity. And, you know, the reality is that it's the same show every year. But yes. It's, it's just, that's just different characters. I'm thinking, oh, my God, like, are we really that dumb? But we, we must be. <laughs> I think that, you know, it, free-to-air television is free for a reason because it's there to lock you into not essentially the content of that show but to there to lock you into advertisers to sell supermarkets and banks and department stores and, you know, technology products, your eyeballs, so that you will be influenced to buy their products. And... Look, not surprisingly, more and more people around the world are tuning to streaming. Um, yeah. Netflix, Apple TV, Stan in Australia, Foxtel, you know, people are going to places where they can download all of their episodes at once. They can binge watch. They can do that by paying a subscription fee and they're not bothered by advertising. Yeah. And, 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 and that is, the, and and that is also, the biggest threat. And they can also choose what they watch. Of course. You know, yeah, like absolutely. I, I, I love YouTube and just watch documentaries and all that, and it's free, and I love it. I just think that I don't have to worry about, you know, all the commercial stuff. But yes. um, I'm really mindful of time because I could talk to you for hours, but have you got a bit more, bit more time for us? Of course I do. Um, I really just wanted to ask you what you believe, being in the media and having exposure to all these different people and things, what do you think, this, what do you think the, the, the modern male tragedy is at the moment? What are, what are males going through that is hard? for them because I think that there is a big evolution with men um, and this is a men's mental health podcast so what's your view on what men are going through at the moment? I think broadly men are having a mirror held up to them uh, and are being shown that the world is not entirely theirs um, and that that is a huge shock for many men of all ages that this male superiority which you know I have to say we've probably all grown up with um, where men make the decisions the women do as they're told um, women are not treated as equal citizens uh, we, we're living in a time certainly in Australia at the moment where women have had more than enough and thankfully are rallying together to stand up for themselves. And are people I'm, I'm, Do you think they're listening? Like, for example, the parliament... I, I don't think stuff. enough people are. I don't think enough people are listening. Uh, they're hearing, but they're not listening. And I just see what is happening at the moment in our national political field and it it appalls me mm. that so many men have this entitlement to decision making mm. um that they are not fully immersed in women's rights mm. um and the advancement of women some of the women are doing it too like i was a bit appalled by that cover up even with the, some of the, the senior members with the women. Like, so you think that from this, because you're a political or you can understand it from a media perspective, do you really think that all of this upheaval is going to demonstrate change? I think that what will I think that what will change is that a political party will suddenly upend itself and say we need to be part of this moment, and if we are not part of this moment now, then we will be damned forever. And I don't know which political party is going to do that. Um, all of the mainstream parties have a lot to learn about their engagement with their women, their treatment of women, their pre-selection of female candidates, um, not just for winnable seats, but just to have the opportunity to stand and run for a political life. Um, it's it, it, it. This moment is extraordinary, and men should just step back 
and let them through. Um, yeah. I, I'm, I'm very fortunate oh, no. that I grew up as a son of a, a woman who was the, the victim of domestic violence, who um, had to give up her career when uh, she was pregnant with me because that was what was expected uh, at the time, um, that my father wouldn't let her return to the workforce. So I understand, I've seen it uh, from my own family, the, 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 the destruction that a male... Um, perspective can bring. Uh, I'm shocked at 51 that we're still having this argument and that women are still having to fight in such a way to be heard. It, it, it Frankly, it disappoints me and it yeah. shocks me and we should all be doing more to advance women. Yeah. I mean, funny, I was listening to ABC Radio this morning and they announced that they the prediction of when equality and pay, the pay equality gap, they don't expect it to be actually finalised till 2027. Yes. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, like, there's more drama. Everyone's holding on to, like, they were saying what you were saying. There's people that are aware, but they're not listening. So they're, Every they're time, saying, yeah, they're saying things that aren't real. Every time I read in a newspaper that an organisation has been caught out for underpaying women against what they pay men, it absolutely shocks and frightens me because as an executive, as a decision maker who employed staff, there was never any sense in anything that I ever did that a female candidate would be paid less than a male candidate. Um, and it shocks me that that still exists. And not only does it still exist, it is encouraged. Yeah. And that, and that, terrible, terrible treatment of women that dismisses a young woman without giving her the opportunity to grow a career because we won't bother investing in her because she's only going to leave and have kids. I mean, it, it, it still exists yeah. and it, it appalls me. Um, in the ABC report, funnily enough, the group that was lacking or falling behind the most were more women organisations. And I found that really funny because they thought that they were okay, but the reporter was saying that they also need to acknowledge that if they're a women's organisation, they need to consider bringing men in. It needs to be more equal. So it's all about changing our beliefs and perspectives, not just thinking it's, you know, women's rights. It's about both. And this will be the last question, because I know that we've gone over, is that, so can we look at the other side of the coin? Like, why is it do you think that men still have no support if they were the, they're being abused? Like, for example, we've done some work on domestic violence, and if a woman rang the police, they would they would come, they would arrest the guy, they would do all things to support the woman. But if a man rang up and said, my wife's beating me up or my gay partner's beating me up, there's nothing. So why do you think we're at that place? A domestic violence report should be treated as a domestic violence report, regardless of the gender of the people involved. I mean, it's that's that's just I, I find that really shocking. Yeah. I think part of it is that we're not used to speaking about domestic violence against men, um, whether that's in same sex relationships or whether it's in heterosexual relationships. Um, but we all need to be mindful that anyone can find themselves in a situation where the power imbalance in that relationship has changed and they are under threat and, and every police service in Australia should be treating that equally. It, 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 yeah, it, 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 and and this and which clearly shows there's a lot of work to be done to educate about domestic violence. But I I would absolutely love to see more education around domestic violence but we're still not doing enough for women who find themselves trapped who are unable to leave their home um, who can't get access to services or programs or shelter and so they stay with the perpetrator because if they left they'd be sleeping on the street or in their car with their kids yeah, and we know that the you know the 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 most common perpetrator for female murders is the partner. So it's like yeah, we have all this information, but we're not acting fast enough. I think it is all that red tape. I do think that they know, but there's red tape that it's political. It's like money. It's all that sort of stuff. So it's interesting. And the whole, the thing about the men getting support is also a shame based thing. Like I think you're right. If we talk about it more, and we're starting to, then there's going to be more dialogue. Like there's a shame thing for imagine. I, can, I can't even imagine a man ringing up 
to say that my wife's beating me up. Do you know I mean that he might feel that uncomfort, so we won't do it, or he may feel like the police will laugh. So I think again, the more that we talk about it, the more that will change. So. And, and as I said, I think we need to do much more around domestic violence education for all levels of government, for all levels of police services, um, because it, it is a problem in our community. And, and, and if we don't talk about it, it will only continue to be covered up. But in fact, you know, we can resource multi-million dollar companies through the COVID crisis um, and allow them to keep the money that they've been allocated by the federal government despite recording record profits on their balance sheets. But how about if some of that money was returned to the government and then was redistributed to domestic violence issues, for example? Wouldn't that be fantastic? Uh, it would be fantastic. And wouldn't it be fantastic if parents and role models around young children, young men, young boys can teach them to respect women? You know, like that's, that's what it I would It starts like. at home. I know, and it starts with really simple things like just saying, you know, it's really interesting. Like, you know, it starts with a, a mother or a father saying yes to the son and no to the girl. Yes, you can go play outside. No, stay, you're going to keep dirty your dress. That mentality then starts to create a division of what boys and girls can do. And then bang. So it's really tricky for parents to actually even consider that that could be a problem. But it is. It's like as soon as a girl gets told no, she's already told there's a difference. Girls can do anything. Unfortunately, they're not always allowed to. And that's yep. what we need to change. Yeah. Andrew, I'm going to let you go. I'm really sorry that I made you talk over. I'm sorry that we didn't get to talk about your achievements and all the great things that you've done, but maybe we can get you back on somewhere down the track. But can I just say that today's podcast has been so insightful and it's so good to talk about these things so openly because I think this is going to allow other listeners to, to do the same thing either on our platform or at home or with their friends. So thank you so much. You're most welcome. You've been listening to the Secret Men's Business Podcast. So don't forget, podcast is out Monday and on Thursday at 9 a.m. So don't hit the subscribe button. And anything that you want to know about Andrew's information will be linked to this podcast on all our platforms. All right, guys, have a great week and we'll see you soon. Bye. Mm-hmm.